Hello everyone, this is Jaren from Marine and Reef, and today I have Jason from Titan Aquatic Exhibits. So, um, first off, what is Titan Aquatic Exhibits, and what do you do there, Jason? Uh, we are a manufacturing company, and we make uh, public aquariums out of acrylic. We also make fiberglass stands. Um, most of the stuff we build is for uh, museums and public aquariums and private homes, but usually some of the wealthier private homes. Um, so, I, I'm the engineer there. Um, also kind of draftsman, I guess is my title. Uh, most of the stuff that I do there is making the CAD um, PDFs and everything for people to verify that all the stuff is correct on the, on the drawings that I make and make sure everything's engineered correctly, make sure everything's going to stay together for, for many years. And <laughs> um, then I take a lot of those drawings and those models and then uh, transform them into something that can be used to cut on our CNC machine. So or the, the shop guys can use them to make yeah. sure that everything's built correctly. And I'll also mention that Jason is a really big reef nerd. I've known him for a long time. And you're also involved in the Arizona Frag, the, our local um, kind of reef club mm -hmm. as well. Yep. Yeah, so probably my favorite Jason story is um, there was one time where before Jason was working at Titan, he was working at one of our local dry goods suppliers. And this is before I was at Marina Reef, I was at a local store. And I remember getting a batch of disc corals in and labeling them all as fungia and Jason coming over and saying, that's wrong, those are cycloceries, they're not fungia. And I remember just staring at him and I didn't see any difference. But I, apparently he's got the eye for that. <laughs> so, you know, Jason is a real reef guy in addition to really knowing about the technicality of building aquariums. So we're going to talk about some acrylic aquariums and stay tuned for more. So, J Jason, because you specialize in acrylic aquariums and you're a hobbyist, I thought I'd just ask you some of you know, the most common questions we get asked about acrylic aquariums. And probably the first one is, when should I buy an acrylic aquarium versus a glass aquarium, which is far more common? Um, it's a little more complicated, but I guess a few of the reasons would be, uh, probably number one is height restriction. Um, you can only go so high with a glass before it becomes unreasonable to have something pre-built and then shipped to your house. Um, yeah. There is a few people out there that'll uh, build it on site, but th that's tough to do. And there's some you know garage guys that'll do plywood <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, systems too. Yeah. So that's kind of in between if you want to save money. Uh, but most of our stuff is pretty tall, and I'm saying like 36 inches and taller. Um, so a 36 inch tall tank to us is pretty small average. Um, so uh, we just got rid of uh, a seven foot, um, or I'm sorry, a six foot cylinder that was uh, 10 feet across um, the other day. So something like that's usually something that we have in the shop. Yeah, um, you know, you mentioned um, the first thing I tell people is when you go really big, because acrylic just is um, sturdier than glass. It, it's at least that's my impression that it lasts longer, the seams are stronger. So like when I used to work in the store, anytime someone wanted a 500 plus gallon tank, I told them they should probably go acrylic. Um, both for the structure, but also um, acrylic generally lasts longer than glass. Um, how yeah. long do acrylic aquariums usually last? Well, technically, it's a long, it, lifetime. As long as you can, uh, you know, keep it around. There's, you know, tanks that can easily go, you know, 50, 70 years or so. Yeah. Um, but you know, that's if you're taking care of the material. Which, you know, if somebody's around that long, around that aquarium to do yeah. that, that's <laughs> probably pretty rare. And that's yeah. That's another good point. Is when it comes uh, glass versus acrylic, the question is, how long do you think you're going to have it in that spot? How long are you going to have this aquarium? You know, think about that. And most hobbyists, you know, move around or, or they change their mind throughout their, their own house and things like that. But a public aquarium, it's probably going to be there for decades. So that's one of the main differences. Yeah, I think that kind of is also along with the size because, I mean, if you have a 30-gallon tank, you're very likely to move it you have a 700 gallon tank, it's probably gonna stay wherever it is for a very long time. Yeah. <laughs> it was probably like a process to get it in there and once it's there, it's gonna stay there. Um, yeah. So that's definitely a reason. Um, the other thing I mentioned to people, and you mentioned too, you mentioned you just finished a big cylinder. Is there some shapes you really can't do in glass? Um, I don't know, because I've never done glass. Uh, gla glass is getting formed in a, a kiln, um, so I imagine you could probably make anything, but the problem with the, uh, either one of those, you have to make a, a tool, an oven formation, to follow whatever shape that is. 
and to make one for glass is going to be a lot more difficult. Um, with acrylic, most of our oven tools or forms are made out of plywood. Yeah. Um, so and most of the times they're just one-time use. We just I cut the shapes out of CNC. We have like a grid system that we make them out of. We'll put a top over it and um, we use that to form the shape. And then when it's done, it just usually just gets chopped up and thrown away or repurposed somehow. Yeah, I, I you know when I was selling custom tanks, I dealt with a variety of glass manufacturers, and I don't know of a single one who would do curved glass. There may be someone out there who charge a lot of money to do it, but and all the acrylic manufacturers yeah. would do it. It was actually like a possibility. So I think if you wanted like a bow front tank or a concave or convex tank of any kind, um, a cylinder tank, as you mentioned, a half cylinder, quarter cylinder, uh, it's going to be really hard to find someone who will do that out of glass. Yeah, and there's companies in the past that used to make um, curved glass, but they have they had like you know steel forms that they could just cookie cutter, same size and everything. But if you wanted something special, uh, yeah, it's it's not going to happen. Yeah, I mean, I guess we're sitting next to this BioCube. It has curved glass, but yeah, they're it's... making a whole bunch of the same one. Mm -hmm. So this isn't like a, a big display tank in someone's house that's curved glass. So, but most custom curved is going to have to be acrylic. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, another thing I would recommend acrylic for when I was selling both glass and acrylic side by side was um, just um, it's a little bit more durable. So I remember we did a series of installs in a preschool, and I thought some kid's going to bang it with a baseball bat. And I just felt way better about the acrylic versus glass. I don't know if you have any take on the acrylic being yeah, more durable I mean, or not. A lot of people, uh, a lot of mainly hobbyists, don't like acrylic because it scratches easier than glass. Yeah. Um, but the good thing about it is it can be fixed. Um, and now there are kits out there that can it can be done while the tank's still full of water because um, most of the scratches happen inside because of, you know, your, your algae cleaner or scrubber or anything like that uh, accidentally got some sand in it and you just ran it across there or something like that, you know. So you can fix scratches inside the tank now with uh, certain kits. And outside's a lot easier, uh, obviously. But, uh, yeah, it can be fixed glass. If it gets scratched, it's it's scratched. Yeah. It's a new tank. <laughs> yeah, I, I personally, I, I really hate scratches, um, but I think the calculation of scratching is if I only have the tank for three years, maybe I'm fine with glass because it scratches less and I'm not going to buff it. But if it's going to be there for 10 years, that scratch and that glass will be there forever. Whereas with the acrylic, maybe every three to five years I'll buff it out. Um, and, and that is kind of an advantage of the acrylic if you have a tank in a long place, you can fix it. Um, yeah, so I think that's another good reason. All right, Jason. So uh, we talked earlier about how acrylic scratches easier than glass. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the most common questions kind of related to that that we get is, um, how do I clean my acrylic? You know, inside people want the algae off, but they're afraid if they use something too aggressive, they'll scratch the acrylic. Um, and on the outside of the acrylic, some common cleaners can cause crazing or damage to the acrylic. So People often ask, what are they supposed to use to clean it? And figured you'd know better than me. So <laughs> what would it people use? Yeah, so um, I guess we'll go for, start with the inside. Uh, inside tank, you're going to want to find an algae-safe um, scrubbing pad if it's just like a film algae or diatom. Those are usually white in color. Um, usually the blue ones or green ones are going to scuff it up, and those are usually for glass. Um, for scrapers, like if you've got some tougher algae or coralline algae, um, just another piece of uh, plastic. There are a lot of... Uh, handheld scrapers they have like replacement blades in them um but sometimes i find just like a credit card yeah. or like a gift card an expired gift card <laughs> something like that will work and i really like um flipper now makes some scrapers oh, that yeah. you put credit cards into and i was like oh man this is a great invention because everybody has plenty of those blades already yeah and if um, you're using a magnet cleaner um you can get the you know safe magnets for the acrylic and the pads also that help out quite a bit so just make sure they're the acrylic safe ones now one tip you shared with me um a while ago um was the dobe pads um which the dobe pads you guys don't know was like a cleaning pad mm -hmm. um that everybody just learned is really good for cleaning acrylic aquariums um yeah they have some new ones out that uh, locally i can't find the the ones that i've used before but they've kind of got like a um fishnet kind of looking a weave to them but it's um, well we might have them because the the dobe pads i heard they went out of business and then i think all seas and lifeguard said they bought them oh. and now they have kind of their own version of them 
So I know if you look on our website, you'll see it and you'll wonder what that is. Those are really nice acrylic pads. Um, yeah. I use those because you can be kind of, they look like they'd scratch, but they don't. And they're really aggressive. Um, so those have always been one of my favorites for that. Um, and then d have you tried like the melamine foam pads? Do you like those at all? They're kind of like Seachem makes some, but I know people would use like magic erasers that are melamine. Yeah, I, I haven't used those before because, you know, usually just the white pads I have do the job. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but hey, I haven't tried any of that kind of stuff. Yeah, I really like those pads, but they do seem to die really fast and they're pretty expensive. Yeah. So if, if you want to spend your money on a premium pad, then something like the Seachem Algae pads are really good, but um, they work really well. They just tend to die really fast, so you might want yeah. to buy the whole jar of them. Yeah. Um, and then for the outside uh, of the tank, um, usually uh, Novus One uh, is a popular um, cleaner. Um, so I'll just try to use like a microfiber rag or something like that to you know spray a little bit on the rag and go in circles and make sure with either one of these in or out. Make sure when you're doing it, don't get too close to the sand bed or um, anything that will pick up debris that could get caught in between whatever you're cleaning the, and the surface and the pad itself because a little piece of dirt or whatever could do a lot of damage before you notice it. Yeah, I'd also say, um, you know, I look at this tank behind me and realize I have the magnet cleaner stuck on the glass. Um, I would really try to not do that, particularly if it had acrylic, because even if you don't pick up something, sometimes you'll get like tube worms and things that'll grow into the pad and then you'll move it and scratch. It's really best if you... Yeah. remove that cleaner whenever you're done with it and don't just leave it on the glass there's a lot of critters that you know starfish like to crawl in there too um that like to hide in there and then yeah. if you don't check it you'll just run it another thing my first aquarium I was in my, my acrylic aquarium when i was in my 20s um i had a, left a magnet cleaner up in the corner and had a little party and a lot of people there and next day it's uh, lots of swirls in it from people trying the magnet out yeah so um yeah it's just another reason just Somebody might want to play around with it while you're not looking and they don't know any better. So, um, yeah, got to be careful with that, too. Yeah. So you mentioned on the outside the, the Novus One. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I picked up working at the fish store is I often just wipe mine um, with a squeegee and just RODI water. And that'll get it close. It won't get it as polished as Novus. But it, there's some things you don't want to use. So what, yeah. what are on that don't use list? Um Usually alcohol, uh, you know, any kind of uh, rubbing alcohol, anything like that. Uh, acrylic has a moisture content to it, and that can dry it out. And that might not happen right away, but it can cause something called crazing, which looks like tiny little fractures in the acrylic. It looks like, uh, you know, glass is breaking, like a tempered glass, but it's, it's not. It's just a surface that's getting tiny little cracks to it. And that's uh, extremely hard to fix, especially if it gets pretty deep. Um, and then ammonia, so any cleaners have ammonia in it, um, like Windex is kind of the popular one. Yeah. Um, but there are some industrial cleaners. We had a restaurant that we had a big cylinder in recently, and um, the cleaning staff was cleaning the table around it, but the spray was pretty aggressive, and over the years it was landing on the bottom yeah. of that and crazing that out as well. So you got to make sure um, any cleaners like that you don't want to use. So Yeah, I remember there was... Um family friend of mine someone i knew back from elementary school and his in-laws moved into a house that had a in-wall acrylic aquarium with a reef insert they knew nothing about fish and he said i know someone and just asked me to show up and i showed up and they were complaining about what i saw as crazy and those little things in it and they because they had been cleaning the tank with with windex and i was like well um not a whole lot you can do to fix that or is there a way to fix the crazing is it yeah, I mean, you would basically fix it like you would a scratch, but just be more aggressive on it. Yeah. And if it's deep enough, you're going to put a lot of work and pressure into it, and that can cause kind of a warped area Yeah, um, where you, like, well. dug into it as you yeah. puff it out. Cool. So you've got to be very careful about that. So, Jason, we kind of started to touch on it, but we talked about buffing out acrylic. And um, I have attempted to buff out acrylic a few times. I've been moderately successful. But I also used to take tanks in and send them to people to be buffed. So I thought I'd just ask you, if someone wants to buff out an acrylic tank, um, what do they do? Uh, like, First off, I guess if they have a dry tank, then maybe it's a used tank or they moved it, what can they do? And then what do they do if it's wet? 
um, to buff out any scratches or crazing, as you mentioned? Um, well, if it's dry, um, you're going to want some power tools. Depending how, if it's just one scratch, you could probably do it by hand. Um, we just there's a lot of handheld kits. I think uh, Rainbow Lifeguard sells yeah, ones. Yeah, they have still. a little one that we have. Yeah, you can do that. But if you, there's bigger ones, um, you're going to probably want a sanding kit. Um, I can't remember any of the companies off the top of my head right now, but there are sanding kits for acrylic that you can use uh, rotary sanders, um, either with air, uh, compressed air, or power sanders. Um, but you're going to probably want uh, a kit that has several stages of uh, sandpaper and polishing um, for that. Uh, and that goes in and outside. Um, now, it comes to the tank underwater, uh, uh, polishing underwater. Um, there are, I think there's like one polisher out there. Um, you need corals might sell it. Yeah. Um, I can't remember. It starts with a P. I can't remember the name of it. Um, I haven't tried that yet. Um, but if it's underwater, usually it's like one or two scratches. So, again, just like the handheld kits kind of work. Um, I think there's also some that you can like a sleeve that you can put on a magnet. And I've seen people do, do that, that well. and I don't know how much of that was a DIY thing of just buying like sandpaper and putting it on the magnet or how much is like something you could buy commercially. Um, and I, you can probably look at some pictures. I've seen videos of public aquariums of divers, you know, buffing out insides of panels. Um, but it is a lot of work. I mean, I have attempted this and in my brief attempts of fixing scratches, um, like hand buffing scratches, I mean, I've spent two hours and then thought, it looks a bit better. Yeah. So it, it is like a, a very labor-intensive process. Yeah, and if you got the money, you can you can buy, spend some money on some nice underwater tools. I think Nemo is a brand that makes some underwater um, rotary tools, mm -hmm. um, but they're expensive. You're probably going to pay, I don't know, probably 1500 for a good one. Um, so something like that would be great if you've got a few aquariums or one big one that's constantly getting scratched, if you're <laughs> very careless, I guess. Um, or if you've got like a you know a small store or something like that, and you've got a lot of acrylic aquariums, um, that might be something to invest into. Yeah, um, and I also mentioned that you can sometimes find people who will buff it for you. Um, mm -hmm. When I um, I was working at the local store, we had a contact for someone who would buff, but he would not buff when water. But we would get people who would have old acrylic tanks, or they'd be moving and say, "While I'm moving, I want my tank buffed." They'd turn it in and they charge a fee and it could be several hundred dollars but the nice thing was that a tank that was maybe thousands of dollars originally could look brand new for 400 bucks um, and a lot of people really did like that so I would just consider a professional you can see if someone will do it because um, you may be worth spending that money rather than buying fifteen hundred dollars of tools go to someone who knows how to use the expensive tools to fix it so Jason, uh, it kind of covers a lot of the most common questions with acrylic. Mm -hmm. Now, I have never had an acrylic aquarium at home. And I've never had one because I've never had that big giant tank I've dreamed of, the cylinder tank, the drop-off tank. But all of those dream tanks I have would be in acrylic. So I, I thought I'd just ask you, this is kind of more of a hobbyist question, but some things people should consider if they're wanting kind of one of these tanks. Um, so... One tank that's always been like a dream tank for me is um, at the store I worked at years ago, we used to have an eight foot by four foot by four foot tall reef tank. And it was just awesome. It was awesome to walk up, see a big wall of fish, wall of coral at eye level. But like you mentioned, anything over three foot tall kind of has to be acrylic. So this is a big acrylic tank. Um, and sometimes hobbyists don't know what they need to do differently when they have a tank of that size. So I, I know um, you don't do a lot of hobbyist size stuff, you do big stuff and you are a hobbyist. So what are some things that hobbyists who want a really big tank of that size maybe need to consider that they might miss? Um, probably number one thing, how are you gonna get it in the door? Uh... This is something I've had. I had people buy tanks, pay me to deliver them, then I show up and it doesn't go through the door. Yeah, how are you gonna, how are you gonna get it from where it's at into your house where you want it to be. Um, so, you know, make sure that it's going to be able to fit through all the doorways. Um, make sure you have a clear path for any kind of carts, um, any kind of scissor tables, anything like that they might need. Something to go up, any ramps, and then you have enough people to help you move it. Um, some places you can rent um, suction cups, which are just big cups with like mm -hmm. little pumps. Get the ones with the pumps on them. And then you could use those to kind of help lift the tank into place or move it and tweak it a little bit if you need to. Um, really depends on how big it is. Um, 
really big tanks, you know, if you can't get it in, you'll probably have to have a, a rigging company um, install it with a crane or something like that. <laughs> so Yeah, I, I think the biggest tank I remember moving myself or helping, I wasn't lifting it all myself, is I did a install on a pizza restaurant that was a 10 by 3 by 30. And that's still not really, really big. It's not a really, really big tank by kind of your standards. But I remember having a dozen people plus two hydraulic jacks just to get it on the stand. Um, so it was quite the operation just getting it in there. Um, and I guess I was glad it was acrylic because if it was glass, it would have taken like quadruple that amount of people. <laughs> this glass is just so much heavier than the acrylic is. So um, besides getting in, is there anything else that people should, should consider? Um, I mean... Acrylic's a little more forgiving, so when it comes to like a stand, um, try to have someplace fairly level. We have fiberglass stands, um, so they don't rust. We can do steel as well, um, but our fiberglass stands are pretty popular. But if you have uh, a corner or something that's you know half inch, you know lower or something like that, you're going to want to shim that. Um, but you don't have to be as careful with it as compared to glass tanks because uh, they're especially when you get into longer panes of glass. Um, they can be pretty sensitive and you can have a pretty nasty crack. I've cracked a few glass tanks in my day because it took, uh, didn't take enough time to level them out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one thing nice about acrylic is it does bend a little a little bit of flex is in the material. So if things aren't exactly perfectly level, it's, it's a little bit more okay. You still want it as level as you can get it. Mm -hmm. But particularly when you're going really big, the amount of just weight and force is so extreme. And that's one of the reasons why the acrylic starts to make more sense is it is a little bit more forgiving. And that's, yeah, if you're getting a bigger tank, whether it be glass or acrylic, um, definitely do some research about your house uh, where, or wherever you're putting it. Um, we've had a customer before that seemed to have a pretty sturdy floor, but it was actually a subfloor. Oh, and didn't yeah. have enough supports underneath that and actually started giving away. And only one corner was dropping by three eighths, but this tank, I believe it was 60 inches tall and we started noticing issues because the top supports where the openings are um one of the corners started splitting and yeah. i did a, a little um test in solidworks and found out well something's dropping in this corner to cause the, everything to flex that way we figured it out that way so and one of one of my destroyed tank stories now i'll share with you guys this is a glass tank I remember doing an install in a long-term customer of mine's house. Um, he wanted a Peninsula 180. So it was a 6 by 2 by 2 180 180-gallon tank. It was custom glass. It wasn't acrylic. Um, but we went into his house. He had a, like many Arizona homes, it was built on a slab. Had where he wanted it. We put it on it. But what we didn't consider is it was on, like, 70s shag carpeting, like really thick carpeting. Put the tank there. Within two weeks, the tank split top to bottom. Just one big crack through it. So we thought, we contacted the tank manufacturer. They said, we're so sorry, we'll give you a new tank. Within two weeks, that tank split right in the middle top to bottom. <laughs> Try another one. <laughs> then we, we pulled up the shag carpeting, and we found that even though it was on slab, there was like a half-inch change right where the tank was sitting, and you just couldn't tell through the carpeting. Um, and then we had to pay someone to grind it down and reinstall the tank a third time. Um, so that was my, my fun experience with that. But this goes to show you that it really is important, especially as you go bigger, to have a level, strong, flat surface for that tank. Yeah. And kind of getting into the floor as well, some of the bigger tanks, the filtration isn't necessarily under the tank, like a lot of them are. Yeah. Um, so and this is probably another common problem that we have a lot of um, our customers is planning out the uh, water and plumbing and all that. Um, how's the return? How's the drain going to come through? And then how's the supply? A lot of supply water well, that might have a top off that yeah. comes under the tank or something like that. Um, so, and that's got to be known too because we have to plan for the stand, um, the supports and everything and the uprights to avoid those areas. So, because you don't want to have everything built and then Whoever poured the concrete have it right over a, a support or a brace where the stand's supposed to go because then we have to completely <laughs> remake a stand or do some interesting cuts to it. Yeah, I would just say, like, when I was quoting people on these large tanks who wanted them in, in their home, you know, a 500,000-gallon home tank, people didn't consider getting the water there. 
They also didn't consider the amount of electricity it was going to use. Uh, usually you needed to have an electrician install dedicated power mm -hmm. just for the tank because a tank that big does use a lot of power. And there's also something about just the redundancy of having multiple circuits, um, like a, an RO system. Like if you have that much water, do you want a hobbyist sized RO system or do you want a commercial RO system? Um, so those are definitely a lot of considerations when you go that big. Yeah, lighting too, you know, because yeah, yeah. You, most, I mean, I don't know how a lot of people are going to run a wireless <laughs> fixtures over their system, so the cord's got to go somewhere. Um, so we do something called a dry chase, um, which sometimes is built into our overflow boxes, which is just usually a bulkhead with a large pipe, like an inch and a half pipe. You can run cords through, um, or you can run it through the back, but... The best way to do it is if it's against a wall or something, just put the electrical. Well, I was going to ask about this because on, on another kind of my dream acrylic tanks, I remember this is 15 plus years ago. <laughs> but I remember going to um, the seas at Epcot and Disney World and they had a cylinder walk around reef tank. An acrylic cylinder is probably like five or six feet in diameter with a pillar and then reefs, you know, with corals. And I remember a big coral banded shrimp. I remember. I just remember staring at this tank forever and my family thinking I was crazy and should enjoy Disney World instead of staring at the tank. <laughs> but one thing with that tank is there are some challenges to walk around tanks. And you talked about the dry box. Um, one of them is getting your power from below down up. Mm -hmm. Is there any other challenge to a walk around tank if someone were to want one of those? Well, yeah, I mean, if the plumbing is going to be somewhere else or like the, the filtration, then you have to consider the same thing. You're going to probably have to cut in the floor and have it routed uh, underneath your, your floorboards or whatever you've got going on into the room that's going into. Um, but uh, other than that, you know, just plumbing and electrical are two main things. And then water supply, kind of mentioned that before. Well, what about flow? Like, I don't want a power head on, like, a viewing panel of my walk-around tank. Like, uh, do you know how people normally tackle flow in those? Um, it depends on what you're doing. We, we make a lot of jellyfish chrysals, too. So we've yeah. made with a, really a pseudo-chrysal, a cylinder. Yeah. Um, and we've done those by either having an overflow, a central overflow box with you know a specialized system at the top, or there'll just be a plate at the bottom with nozzles coming pointing through the grate. So you'll have the drains on the bottom, and then you'll have return nozzles pointed in a you know either clockwise or counterclockwise direction, at least in the same direction yeah, going I guess through that. Spinning. Yeah, I, I think like closed loops are kind of a bit. I mean, there's a reason why hobbyists don't often use a closed loop. Um, but on a lot of these walk around tanks, it's the really only way to kind of get it looking good is to kind of have holes basically through the bottom where either water sucking in and out versus a power head on the glass. Yeah. Um, the last one I thought I'd ask you about, cause if I were to do it, I'd do it in acrylic. And I, I was telling crazy Dave earlier <laughs> that, um, my in-laws had mentioned to me that maybe, maybe when they pass away, we might get their house. So the first thing I did was decide what fish tank I'd put where in their house. And there's a spot where I've dreamed of a peninsula drop-off tank. And I've measured it out. And I've measured the dimensions of the tank I could fit there. And I've measured how I'd put the plumbing in there. Um, you can tell that this is obviously the best thing to do um, when you're in this situation is plan where the tank's going. But I love drop-off tanks. But I know there's some unique challenges to drop-off tanks. Uh, if someone who's done some of them, what, what do they do when you do a drop-off? Um, I mean, we're... Usually when we build an aquarium, a rectangle one, um, we usually take the front and the back panels and sandwich them in between the side panels and then put the top and the bottom on um, afterwards. With a drop-off tank, we actually have to build the bottom panels, both sets, and then the front and the back being the peninsula, so the shorter side, and then the top, and then we sandwich the longer L-shaped front and back panels, or I guess we'd call them side panels at this yeah. point, <laughs> in between all of those and then route off the excess. So it's just a different order of doing all that. And we usually, with that cliff that comes off the first um, bottom, we'll usually put a little lip. So if you want to put sand up there or something, it doesn't all blow off and just uh, fill in the lower area. Yeah, I mean, I, I love drop-off tanks, but I think there are, like, there's just the construction of it. There's getting that custom shape, that custom size. Um, and I think people also have some flow issues in there. It, it may be another case where a closed loop would be best because it's really hard to put power heads in the middle of that drop off and not have a cord running through everything. Yeah, and you could put the couple of bulkheads on the lower sidewall yeah. and have them run through that to kind of point at some stuff and still be fairly hidden depending on your rock work. Yeah. 
So and if you want to go one up from a uh, you know peninsula drop off, make it a uh, bullnose. Oh yeah, the curve front peninsula yeah, drop off. The curve on that too. You know why not go all out? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we can always dream. We'll, we'll be waiting on it. Yeah. <laughs> so, Jason, um, I thought we were wrapping up. And then you said, let me tell you what we just did. It apparently, it was one of the most complicated tanks you've ever done at Titan. So, why would you just finish up? Yeah, so uh, this is something that uh, we, we did along with uh, Tenji uh, out of California. And this is a oh, yeah, tank yeah. that went to um, a resort in Hawaii. Um, and it was a bar top tank. But the bar top uh, was... I guess picture a 13-sided polygon, but 10 of those sides have um, seating areas that are curved at the bottom. So they go flat and then curve up so that people can put their legs underneath the table. And then the top goes in and then it has an angled inside so you can kind of see the fish still in there. And then there's an open <laughs> top. And then okay, this was our most challenging um, Piece that we had to make it in two pieces because it couldn't fit in a, a regular container to get it to the island either. So, oh, so you had to finish it on site? No, we no? had to make it in two pieces, and I had to make what several people considered <laughs> called it Noah's Ark as a structure to carry it into the container and hold it steady so it doesn't rock on the ship in the boat. And that it was everything about this was more complicated. Um, so not only did we had to, to make several oven formed panels but just to cut the angles the weird ununiform angles that th this shape had we had to make several tools to have each piece sliced perfectly so when we bonded them together it was perfect um and i've, I've this thing has been something that's been ongoing for six plus months <laughs> and we finally just got out of the door and when i got it in the container we got it in i think by three eighths from hitting the you know, just that's how much by. space that we had Three eighths, <laughs> and the whole is, thing was what is thirteen. What's the name of the uh, resort in Hawaii? Uh, I do not remember that. <laughs> <laughs> well, next time I go to Hawaii, I'm going to tell my family we need to go there, and I'm going to explain because this is the Titan tank. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Mainly, I was just dealing with the uh, the, great, the guys at uh, um, Tenji and great people over yeah, there. Yeah, they do some great installs. Um, I've seen some images of like um, some beautiful planted tanks that they've done. They're just, just stunning, just stunning installs. So yeah, uh, yeah, that thing was uh, it was tough because the whole thing was about twenty six feet <laughs> side to side. So it, it was it was tough to get just working with that and it, you know all hands on deck when we had to move it anywhere. And then we had a steel, a stainless steel um, steel structure that had to go underneath that. That was very complicated too. So yeah, well, next time you're looking for that bar top table for your resort, it sounds like he's the guy. <laughs> no, <I'm> just kidding. <laughs>